I feel like it's uh, based on a like a evolution type, okay. like a theory. Okay. So that we came from like uh, species that like were that have developed over time. So that's basically, and then I, before that, you have to say God from the. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't really. Um, I think we were germs that originally just kind of grew and evolved over time. Oof. I, I, I couldn't give you an honest answer. I don't know that. Um. I don't really have a particular belief. I just imagine I come and then I stay until I'm gone. Like the Big Bang, God created the world, it's all the same thing. You know what I mean? Okay. We are beginning a brand new series today called What If It's True? What If It's True? The idea and premise of this series, and I think it's fitting for the time that we're in right now, is, yeah, there's a lot of beliefs out there, a lot of, lot of ideas about creation, about the Bible, about Jesus and his resurrection. But we're going to present to you in this series, we're going to present to you the reasons and arguments of, of some of the things that you even have heard, and why do we believe? And we're going to ask that question. I mean, what if it's true? What if God's word is true? What if, what if God did create us in his image and likeness? What if Jesus did raise from the dead? What does that mean for us and what should our response be? What if it's true? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You should have handouts in the back of your seat. There is just one handout per person because we're limiting the exchange of, of everything. So you can take that handout and let it be yours. Don't put it back because you already picked your nose, okay? So... <laughs> Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is, this is what our faith believes. This is what the Bible has taught us. So for a lot of you, this is what you were told for a, a, a many, many years, possibly. But what happens, though, is that because we don't know the other side of the story, we don't know what maybe other people's theories and beliefs are when we get exposed to them, some people... They have doubts and concerns and, and, and fears. And I think it's really important that we establish this question, man. What do we believe? What do we believe? And here's, here's why it's important. Because how we view our origins determines how we live our lives. So, so if you think that, that this is all just chance, that we were created by chance, and, and it's all just part of a this 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 gooey process, then you're going to live your life and make your decisions based upon that, that there is really no meaning at all. If you don't get the right how, you will never land at the right why. We need to, we need to, we need to have a, well, what is the right, what's the right how? So here's the question today is where do I come from? So where do I, do I come from? What I want to do today is answer this question for you. Some of you have an idea about this. You have a thought about this, but, but maybe it isn't as an informed thought as, as it should be. And I want to give you the other side of the story. And I want to show you why you can actually have faith in your faith. Amen, somebody? So where, where do we come from? Here's, here's the, the, the big kind of like, like two big theories that are out there. Where do we come from? Here's the first. Evolution. Evolution. That's a theory. The evolution theory, which claims that different kinds of living things developed and diversified from earlier forms of living things into brand new kinds of things. This is what evolution theory is. And this is what our kids are, are taught in elementary, in high school, and in college. And some of you may have been taught that and may have rocked in your, your, your thought process about what do we believe. And some people, they shut a blind eye to it and they go, just, no, no, never mind. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna choose to believe. I'm gonna choose to believe and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna believe without ha developing a well informed thought about why we believe and where we come from. Here's the actual, like, where we come from. This is a statement that, that evolutionists say. Look at this from goo to you by way of the zoo. <laughs> this is what they believe from goo to you by way of the the zoo. Now, now the goo portion, you guys have heard the whole primordial soup. Some of you have heard. Like some people believe that, that we were, like, like before there was ever any creation at all, there was just soup. <laughs> How'd the soup get there? I don't know. But there was this goo. There was this, they called it a primordial goo, primordial 
soup. And, and the proponent of this, his name is Stanley Miller. Stanley Miller, he, what he did is um, he, he got like the tests and goo and tried to recreate all the different, which you need 50 different like elements to come together to create life as it were and he did and he he got into this like make-believe world like a like a, ho a homeostasis and like okay let me try to recreate life from just this this goo which is just crazy just to think of it because stanley miller became an intelligent designer at that point like he actually wasn't trying to intelligently design anyway did that go over your head did you guys get that like stanley miller tried to create life in that okay anyway so so here's what happened, though. This is, this is a, a, a quote, and I got a few different quotes that are not inside your, in, your, in your notes. What Miller created, and this comes from Robert Shapiro, a biochemist. What Miller created is tar. That's what he created. With only two of the necessary 50 organic ingredients that are as needed to create life. Okay, so, so because of this today, and as of like the 90s, actually, you may not know this, but as of like the early 90s, scientists, biologists are moving away from the primordial soup. Not many of them that are even atheists believe in it anymore because it's just so ridiculous and cannot be proven. And the reason is, is how Denton kind of explains in this evolution uh, a theory of crisis. What he says is the necessary ingredient is oxygen for us to live. However, the, the elements needed to create life cannot have oxygen. Oxygen will kill the elements as it is created, so, so it's a catch-22. If we have oxygen, we have no, no organic compounds. They cannot, they will not live. Once exposed to oxygen, they'll die, the building blocks of life. But if we don't have oxygen, we don't have any either. It's almost as if life happened. It's almost as if life happened kind of just immediately developed and formed in an instant because the oxygen would kill any form of life. Evolution is the theory that, that came from the writings of, you guys know the man, Charles Darwin. He wrote a book in 1859 called The Origin of the Species. And Darwin, Darwinian evolution said that there would be a change of kinds over the course of millions of years. Now, what does that mean, a change of kinds? I'm sorry to get academic, but I just, you, need to, you need to understand this. And I really hope that in this series, we can increase your understanding. What does he mean by kinds? Well, there's about 14 different kinds of species on planet Earth. There's about 14 different kinds of species. Um, what he's talking about here is micro and macro evolution. And there's a big difference. It's, there's a difference between micro and macro evolution. Micro evolution turns a wolf into a chihuahua. Or, or a Great Dane, think about that. I don't know why, why, why that would happen, but that's what they say, okay? Macro evolution would turn a fish into a cow or a fish into a, a duck. There's a massive difference between the scale of effect between micro evolution and macro evolution. Micro evolution is, is called adaptation that, that even in the human species, we, we see differences based on geographical region of skin tones and colors and hair and to protect ourselves from the elements and things like that. That's called micro evolution. So listen, this is what you need to know about evolution. Okay, guys, macro evolution. There is not one single piece of evidence that macro evolution has ever happened or occurred, I'm getting caught here, hey, hello, there we go, has, 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 that's okay, we're okay now, has occurred since, since the creation of, of mankind. Now, now there are some, some evolutions that have happened, some adaptation, so let me kind of walk you through some of them, because evolutionists will say, well, take a look at the stickleback fish. The, the stickleback fish is, is something that, that they, okay, was uh, this species of fish that over the course of so long, so long, it actually changed metabolic nature, its DNA change. And so that's, that's a form of, of, of evolution that has happened. But, but Darwinian evolution, listen, is a change of kind. So guess what the stickleback fish, fish turned into? A stickleback fish. <laughs> just a different form, just like just a, a it's a stickleback fish. Everything about it is still a stick, is stickleback 
fish. Okay, but then they'll point to some bacteria. Well, we got this bacteria, and this bacteria, you know, has, has changed and evolved, and, and so we can evolve. But guess what the bacteria turned into? Another form of bacteria. Okay, all right. And then they'll point to maggots. They have these maggots. These maggots really for, like, like they evolved. These maggots evolved over time. But you guess it. What did they turn into? They turned into maggots. Okay, okay. Lastly, there was this finch. They even call it Dar- Darwin's finch. It's an actual finch, Darwin's finch. So this, this form of finch is, is said to have like evolved over time, which it has adapted its beak and colors and things like that over time. It has adapted, but, but the finch turned into a finch, okay? There is no change of kinds. There is never has been, ever has been a change of kinds. But, 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 you, you, you've probably seen it in, in like books and taught that didn't we come from monkeys? Haven't they had discoveries of, of monkeys? So you may have seen a chart that looks like this, this evolutionary chart that goes from this ape called Lucy all the way down to modern man. And there's these, all these different types of the, the, these, these bones and archaeological discoveries of, of different, you know, fragments that would, that piece together over the course of millions of years. And this is something that has been taught and is not taught as much anymore because of the findings. How many of you know that science is just catching up to God? That science never contradicts God. Science will always catch up to God. It will always catch. So let me show you, let me break this down and magnify this a little bit uh, with Lucy. Nearly all experts agree that Lucy was just a three-foot-tall chimpanzee. Wow, a chimpanzee. Okay, the next uh, person on the chart is someone called the Heidelberg Man. He was built from a jawbone that was conceded by many to be quite human. All they had was a jawbone, a jawbone that was big, quite human, and they built the Heidelberg Man. Okay, the next person on the evolutionary chart, they say, is the Nebraska man. Scientifically built up, check this out, from a tooth. One tooth. Later found to be the tooth of an extinct pig. This has already been found and proven, these things. And a lot of it was like intentionally malicious to present falsified information. Here's the next person. is the Piltdown Man, someone you've probably heard. The jawbone, jawbone turned out to belong to a modern ape. And that's all they had was the jawbone. And they built something on the chart and said, that's where you come from. Here's the next person on the chart, the Pecking Man. Supposedly 500,000 years old. But all evidence have disappeared after the discovery. Huh, interesting. Here's the next person on the evolution chart, the Neanderthal man. At the, inten- at the International Congress of Zoology in 1958, Dr. A.G.E. Cave said his examination showed that this famous skeleton found in France over 50 years ago is that of an old man who suffered from arthritis. So this is, this is what is being probably taught to some of you, or taught to even your kids. Here's the next person on the chart, the New Guinea man. Dates way back to 1970. Wow, that's a long time. This species has been found in the region just north of Australia. Okay, look at him. He's just, that's a man, okay? The next person on the chart is the Cro-Magnon man. One of the earliest and best established fossils is at least equal in physique and brain capacity to the modern man. What's the difference? And then here's the last person, I think, on the chart. Modern man. This genius thinks he came from a monkey. <laughs> Proverbs, or Romans chapter 122, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. See, evolutionists would have you believe that you, 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 that you share 98% DNA with a monkey. That's what they would, they would have you believe. That why, and, and because of that, you have a common ancestry. Could it be that the breath of God, that the creator himself carries a part of him in everything that he created? Because it's actually, you also share, check this out, 92% DNA with a mouse. Did you know that? You share 50% DNA with a banana and 44% DNA with a fruit fly. So here's your new evolutionary chart. There you are. There you go. This is where... According, like, according to their science, this is how we, I can, I can make the case. This is how we evolved from a fruit fly, banana, mouse, ape. Okay, you all get the hint. Proverbs 14 says it this way. There is a way 
that seems right, doesn't it? It just seems right. Oh, I can, I can put my hand around that. I can put language to that. That seems right to a man, but in the end is, is death. See, that's why Albert Einstein and many scientists, they actually, the more they study science, look what it says here. Albert Einstein said this, the more that I study science, the more I believe in God. See, here's the truth. A little bit of science will steer you away from God, but a lot of science will point you to a creator. It always has, and it always will. So what's the other theory then? On, aside of evolution, the other big theory is creation. Is the creation theory, the bringing into existence of the universe as an act of God. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. You heard the evolutionists from Gu to you by way of the zoo. Here's the creation statement. God spoke, you woke. There you go. That's, that's the creation theory. From the telescope to the microscope, God's creation is declaring his glory. Now, even in the video, when we went out and talked to people, and some of you have talked to people, and a, a lot of people, they'll say the word Big Bang. They'll have this Big Bang. That, you know, that's where, right? Isn't that what, where we have come from? The Big Bang. Listen, anything that bangs must have had something to bang. Look, the Big Bang needs a big banger. I don't know about you, but bangs just don't happen out of nowhere, okay? Okay, and, and anything that bangs does not create order. It creates chaos. And so even very many like, like, like astrophysicists are Christians because of this. Because the heavens declare the glory of God. Here's one astrophysicist, Hugh Ross, says this, that the chances that a planet like Earth would exist by chance are, are 10 to the 138th power. Y'all don't know how big that number is. Okay, listen, let me take, give it some context. The number of atoms in the entire universe, not just the earth, but in space, the universe is 10 to the 82nd atom. So the, the, the chances that earth would have been created, there would be enough, you know, of the, enough of this 10 to 138th power, there'd be enough to touch Every atom with some left over in the entire universe. So in essence, what they're saying, in effect, there is a 0% chance that life could exist as it does by chance according to the science, according to the math, according to the numbers. One astrophysicist said, it would be like getting a bag of Legos and dumping it on the floor and it landing in the structure perfectly as the Eiffel Tower. Look, chaos cannot create order. It just cannot happen. The human body itself is one that is beautifully designed, so orderly. Uh, even the human eye, the human eye, my goodness, there's so many intricacies to the eye and how detailed that, that the eye is. Charles, Charles Darwin described the eye as one of the greatest challenges to his theory. How could he explain it? The eye, after all, is simply incompatible with evolution. Look what Charles Darwin actually said. To suppose that the eye, with all of its imitable controversies, like, like it is able to zoom in and zoom out and, and is able to reflect light and flip it up. It just, there's, just, there's 130, like, what they call them, like receptors. and It's just crazy, this eye. It could have been formed by natural selection. Seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Maybe you should have read Proverbs chapter 20 that says, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. You want to you wanna make an atheist backslide? You want to know how to make an atheist backslide, somebody? Here's how you do it. You ask them, you start here, do you believe in God? Well, of course, they're going to say, well, no, no, I don't. Well, then ask them something like this, especially if you're standing in a building like this, do you believe in this building? Well, of course, I believe in this building. What do you mean? We're, well, why do you believe in this building? Because it's here and I'm standing in it. Right. Because buildings don't build themselves, do they? The fact that there is a building influences our decision that there had to have been a builder. 
just as a painting points to the reason and fact that there was a painter. It doesn't matter if the painter has been dead for 300 or 1,000 years. We got the painting to prove that there was a what? A painter. So here's the question, really. Can nothing create something? Which is a scientific impossibility. No scientist or, or evolutionist would even say this statement. They'll reason it away in different ways. Can something create nothing? Or did someone create everything? See, as you study the science, it more and more points to the reality. It just points that the heavens declare the creator, the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 3 and 11 says he has made what? Everything beautiful in its time. So here's the question that we're going to ask throughout this series. So what if that's true? What if, what if this is true? What if God's word is true? What if we, in fact, do have a creator? Here's what the psalmist said. I will give thanks to you, God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful you are, your, are your works, and my soul knows them very well. Have you ever wondered why you're here? Have you ever wondered, like, why was I created amidst all the create everything that God had ever created? Why me? Why little old, maybe thinking insignificant me? Was it just to satisfy a hidden need that, that your creator, God, had? Was it because he was bored, hanging around the universe in the empty void and just thought, you know what, I, I'm, I, I need something to do? Was it, was it, what was it for? Maybe it was because he was just curious and wanted to know what would happen if he made some, some creation in, in a, a way off in a distant uh, land somewhere that is inhabitable. What, 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 why was I created? What did God make us? Now look, the, the, the Bible tells us, so it gives us some glimpses as to why maybe the Lord created us. I'm going to give you three of them because if that's true, then you have a creator. And if he created us, here's number one. You were created to have a relationship with God. Now, if you missed last week's message, I'd love for you to go check that out because we spelled out the difference between relationship and religion. And how it's so easy to get sucked up into the do's and the don'ts and this old like, like religious duty thing. You were not created to be a good boy, be a good girl. You were created to have a relationship with a loving father. If Exodus chapter 34 says this. He is a God who is passionate about his relationship with you. God is passionate not about how you behave. Or what you do, he's passionate about his relationship with you. Hosea says it this way. God, speaking through the prophet, he says, I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want what you can give me. I want your love. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. You were created to know God, you can point back to this all the way in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, when God created male and female and breathed life into them, he would walk with them in the garden, in the cool of the day. He would have fellowship, community, conversation, relationship as a loving father with the children that he created. You were created to have a relationship with God. And that's why you exist, to be in relationship with God. Look at the beauty of this in 1 John chapter 3. I love how it puts it. He says, look with wonder at the depth of the fathers, not just this judge, not a distant God, but your father who has breathed life and created you. Look at the wonder at the depth of the father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. He has called us and made us his very own beloved, what? Children. It says this, that the reason the world doesn't recognize who we are is that they didn't recognize him. Beloved, we are God's children right now. However, it's not yet apparent what we'll, we will become. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen at the other. We just don't. It is, it is not completely clear because you're not completely God. But we do know this, he says. We do know that when it is finally made visible, we will be just like him, for we will see him 
as he truly is. That there'll come a day where we transfer from this temporal life, this earthly life, and we put on eternity. You were created to have a relationship with your creator. Here's the second truth, because if that's true, number two, you were created to worship God. You were created to worship him. Every person, everywhere, worships. Every person, everywhere, because worship is a fundamental drive of life. God created every human with this drive to worship, to magnify, to express love and affection and desire. It's in everyone. So every single one of us is worshiping something or someone, whether it's money or hobbies or jobs or people, everybody is wired for worship. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, in another translation, I'll read the entire verse here. He has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose, in the human heart. Every person understands this, that we were made for more. There's more to this life. There's got to be more. God deposited something in you that knows we were made for more, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. You can try to satisfy it with people or success or money or pleasures or vacations or stuff or materialism, whatever. It will never satisfy. The only thing that can satisfy the longing that you were created by your creator with is God himself, is a relationship with God. And then it continues. He says, yet man cannot find out. We can't comprehend or grasp what God has done, his overall plan from beginning to end. I mean, we can try. Let's say, I mean, we're going we're gonna to continue to try to gain knowledge and reach out to the stars, but there is no way that God's mind can fit in your mind. There's just no way. If it did, then you'd be God, okay? There's just no way. We cannot comprehend it. Everyone, no matter who they are, worship someone in something. Truly, certainly, we don't all worship the God in heaven, but we all worship something you were created by God to worship. Mark chapter 12, Jesus says this. This is how we worship God. This is the greatest commandment. He says, you're to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. This is what worship looks like. Not just singing songs or clapping your hands. It is loving the Lord with all of your heart and soul, your mind and your strength. What does that mean? A few extra notes here. I don't have it up here on the screen. What does that mean? Heart and soul means you're to love God passionately. Do you know God wants your passion? God wants your passion. He wants you. He is passionate about his relationship with you. You ought to be passionate about your relationship with him. We're to love him with our heart and soul. That's our passion. We're to love him with our mind. That means we're to love him with our thoughts to be passionately in love with him, to be thoughtfully in love with him, and then with our strength, we're to be practically in love with God. Not just in theory, not just in thought, but in our practice, with our strength, we're to love God, which leads to the third point that I have for you. If we're created by God and that's true, then I was created to live for God. I was created to live for God. Here's what Colossians chapter 1 says. 16 says for in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and what you were created for him you were created to have a relationship with God you were created to worship God but you were created to live for God. Do you know that God has a purpose for your life? That you were created intentionally, specifically in the mind of God. Ephesians says that you are a masterpiece of God. And before you were ever born, he had good works for you. Planned and destined for you. So here's your feeling. I was created on purpose. You're not an accident. You're not by chance. Yeah, you're just one amidst millions and billions. But God created you on purpose purpose for purpose to live with purpose first peter chapter 2 verse 9 and then we're going to pray you are a chosen people look 
you, you, you stand apart from animals, from apes, from germs, from birds, from, from you, you stand apart. Mankind is, is, was created in the image of God. We bear the image of God, the breath of God, the soul. You are a chosen people in a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare. Here's the reason. Here's why you were created, chosen, set apart, breathed life into little you and me, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. This is why you were created. Can I pray for you, church? Can I pray for you? Can we bow our heads all across this worship center? God, we thank you. We thank you that you chose us. And you thought it was good and pleased you to create us, not just mankind, but individually, God, designed, thoughtfully, purposefully, given unique gifts, abilities, purpose. Thank you, God, for your handiwork in our lives. God, I pray that we would not live unintentional, that we would not mistakenly believe that we are just one of so many insignificant but that we would realize we are one of a kind purposeful designed to have a relationship with you God a loving father with every head bowed and every eye closed if you're here today and maybe maybe you have never made a decision to accept God as your Father. This was made available and only available through His Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you shall be saved. You can have a fresh start and a relationship with God today through Jesus Christ. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today, and that's something that you need to start. You need to initiate. Or whether you're joining us online today. And that's something that you need to initiate today. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out. I want to pray with you right there. Maybe you've walked away from God. And you need to come back to Him. You need to start putting faith in your faith again. And living intentionally, purposefully. I'd love to pray for you right now. With every head bowed and eye closed. I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, I want you to be bold and lift up your hands so I can pray for you right there. Come on, one, two, three. Lift up that hand and be bold. Let's go. Yes, yes, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Good job. Thank you, God. Praise you, Jesus. Amen back there. Yep, yep. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you pray something like this right there? Just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, my mistakes, my past. Today, I surrender my life to you and I give you control. I declare with my mouth, you are my Lord, my God and my Savior. Jesus, come live inside of me and make me brand new. Thank you, God, for a fresh start. I receive it today. God, I speak over every person right now that we would not shut our minds off to the reality, to truth, to science. God, you own it all, and you're not afraid of it. It points to you. The heavens declare it. Science declares it. God, I pray that we would lean into our faith like never before and be bold witnesses in a time and season of struggle and fear where people are being tossed to and fro because their hope is not in you. God, use us as confident witnesses of your good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today. Amen. Amen.